In its continued efforts aimed at stabilizing the operations of the financial market and the by extension uh, of an Nigerian economy, the Central Bank of Nigeria has directed commercial banks in the country to review their loans, exposure to oil and gas, of course, agriculture, telecommunications sector, among others. According to the Apex Bank, the COVID-19 pandemic equally led to massive disruptions in the economy and business operations, creating urgent needs for businesses to adopt technology, which will reinforce the need for cyber resilience in the face of rapid technology adoption. However, a recent data from the CBN shows that from January till date, about 157.5 billion naira has been disbursed for 29 rail sector projects under the rail sector support facility, while 857.6 billion naira has been disbursed for uh, 234 rail sector projects from November 2018 till May 2018. Uh, joining me to look at this more, uh, she's joining me via Zoom. She's a semi-senior financial advisory at Deloitte, Temi Tokpe Olubile. It's good to see you, Temi Tokpe. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, uh, let me ask my question this way. You know, resilience in funding markets is greatly tested during the period of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, one of the most important successes of uh, banks, of a bank, is its ability to reduce the bulk of bad loans. You will agree with me. Now, how do you see banks develop more robust framework to critically assess their exposure to different subsectors? And why do you think oil and gas, agriculture, and other services sector added to the cautious list uh, of the exposure? Um, okay, so I suppose I'll just start from the last question first. I'll just answer that first. Um, so in terms of why the oil and gas and, you know, the agri sectors may have been added to the cautious list, um, take, for instance, oil and gas. Um, we see that banks over the years have historically favored, you know, the oil and gas sector for, you know, lending. And that's with obvious reasons because, you know, the uh, when... When the market is good, I mean the global oil market, you know, it's it's good returns for you know the banks in terms of lending to players in that in that space. But you know, we've learned over the years that especially taking the 2015, 2016 um experience where oil prices crashed suddenly, we've seen that you know the global oil price is it has like a cyclical movement, right? And it's beyond the control of the people that the banks actually borrow to, you know, you can't control it as a, as a player in the, in the Nigerian oil and gas sector. So we see that because of that, there's that, um, there's that risk, you know, for lending to the oil and gas sector. And that, you know, that may be, a, you know, a reason why, you know, especially coming off the back of, you know, the 2015, 2016 experience and, you know, even the 2020 experience, you know, we, we've seen that, you know, Lending to the oil and gas sector can be both good and very bad at the same time, you know, and if we look at the agri sector also, it might be, you know, because of, you know, security reasons, we see that the farmers, you know, have many, some farmers have been made to abandon their farms, you know, reduced output, and, you know, obviously this reduces the um, their ability to repay their loan. So, you know, those are the reasons why, you know, these sectors may have been added to the um, cautious list in terms of lending from the banks. And we see that, you know, banks have, you know, again, taken from the back of this experiences, especially in the oil and gas sector, we see that they have, in a sense, learned some lessons and they are, you know, structuring these loans, you know, with a better understanding of risk, of the inherent risk to lending to these sectors. And, you know, in terms of, in the event, rather, of, you know, a possible default, they are, they are prompt to, you know, restructure these loans and, you know, adjust accordingly, you know, flexible, you know, structuring of these loans. We see that they've learned that lesson on the back of the 2015, 2016 experience. So I, I, I suppose that those are the reasons why these sectors have been added to the list. And, you know, those are the um, mitigating uh, measures, you know, the banks are putting in place, you know, even ahead of, ahead of, you know, being, these sectors being put on a cautious list. Uh, are we saying that uh, this could help improve our uh, non-performing loan ratio? Uh, talking about bringing down the percentage further? Um, yes, you know, yes. It, obviously, you know, you want to be proactive rather than reactive, right? And we see that, you know, from the NBS, the... Um, 
the banking data, we see that, you know, um, released by the MBS, we see that um, non-performing loans are, you know, above 6%, just slightly above 6%, you know, and above the, um, the threshold, you know, of five uh, percent so obviously you want to do everything to bring down your um your non-performing loan ratio so if you either one maybe don't lend to these sectors but that that is a bit tricky because you know take for instance oil and gas sector uh it, it's you know it's it plays a significant role in our in, in our revenue inflows in nigeria so for for obvious reasons then they're still going to be lending to this sector. Agri sector, you want to lend to, you know, farmers for food security reasons, right? So, you know, there these are very critical sectors, but, you know, you want to also be aware of the risks that are inherent in lending to these sectors so your loans don't go bad and, you know, non-performing non -performing loan ratios then increase as a result. So it's just to be proactive rather than reactive. Hmm. Uh, well said. Now let's now look at the kind of interplay or uh, what sort of interplay do you see between businesses, market participants in the field of intervention funds? Uh, let's look at targeted facilities, moratoriums, interest rebates and households and market loans and of course regulatory forbearance. What more can both the fiscal and monetary authorities do to preserve the market and ensure stability? Hmm. Um, okay, so, you know, it, it then becomes a, you know, a balance between, you know, throwing money at these issues and actually um, being sure that these, the, the funds and the financial support measures are having an impact, right? So, I think one thing to do is, you know, to have a, a, a well-defined selection criteria, right, for, you know, lending to these sectors. You want to channel support, financial support measures to, you know, high impact sectors. So impacts in terms of financial returns, in terms of well-being of citizens, you know, you want to be able to identify these sectors and channel, you know, adequate, you know, this adequate financial support to these sectors. So there's, you know, the selection criteria. There's also, you know, they could also, you know, have um, established a monitoring and um, reporting framework, right? So um, in terms of, you know, we see a lot of, we see data sometimes on the amount of money and the amount of um, credit facilities, you know, to the real sectors. But, you know, we, we, we want to see and it will be useful to see more of you know a monitoring and a reporting framework in terms of being sure that these funds are used efficiently and you know they are having the impact that they are supposed to have so yes financial support measures are good for you know is in terms of how and where these um, financial support measures are being channeled and you know how they are being monitored i, I think that's another uh, that's something to be done and that's something that um there might be a gap and it could could help, you know, in ensuring that these funds are being channeled properly. Now, Timmy, talk about th there are some remarkable threats, of course, in the markets. Uh, we can go on and on. Drops in yields, government securities, slow down funds to the equities markets. This is staring us in the eye. We we're seeing it. Now, how do we develop and tap into the new emerging sectors? But of course, as individuals, businesses, and governments, we see digital solutions, uh, businesses, and other tech-related services, of course, taking center stage. Yeah, 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 you're very correct in that. You know, the the digital um, solution businesses, you know, they seem to be very attractive to investors at the moment. And, you know, it's with obvious reasons, you know, investors are seeing an opportunity to, you know, replicate the successes of some of these um, solutions that have been recorded in advanced countries. They're seeing an opportunity to replicate it in Nigeria. We're already seeing some success stories, you know, so that's why there's been an increased, um, increased funding, you know, for startups in these, um, in these spaces. And, um, and also, there's also the um, the reduced, you know, operational costs because, you know, when some, you know, things you need for these um, startups, you know, are, you know, licenses, secure the right licenses and, you know, have a quality and sound team, right? So that's, you know, those are some of the reasons why there's increased um, funding to these sectors. And I, I suppose the thing to do now is, you know, to to continue to engage these sectors and these, um, these players rather and, you know, 
So because we see that there's this flow of investment funds, you know, to these um, players, you know, funds that could have, you know, maybe been channeled otherwise to the equities market or to the money market. So you want to also maybe it could be useful if you attract these um, players, right? You know, if they are maybe listed companies, they sometime in the near future become listed companies, you know, just continually engage them policy wise and um in terms of the of the environment they find themselves operating in so i think it's just to continue to keep them engaged and um, keep them um encouraged and motivated you know because by and large these um fundings that go to these players you know they also play a role in attracting um forex inflows right so you want to you don't want to stop that channel of forex inflows because investors are seeing a huge opportunity for you know growth in these um digital solution um businesses so it's to continue to keep them engaged and to keep them playing in the nigerian space i suppose and continue to attract investors into the country i think i think that's the thing to do now now Tobin, before i let you get back to work let's look at expanding the access to funds from banks and of course how technological uh, innovations can be leveraged upon to aid this application uh, that's talking about operational efficiency and the reach of financial services, especially my focus now is the MSMEs that might not necessarily have the structure of large corporates. What are your thoughts? Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, MSMEs, you know, to bring them to have the structure of, you know, large corporates, you know, is for funding, it's the lack of funding opportunities, right? So, um, but, you know, what we see, uh, you know, what has been playing out is that, you know, many of these banks, they, they tend to have, you know, um, units or teams, you know, that are focused on um, SMEs and MSMEs, you know, and increasing their, their capacity, you know, by providing financial support measures. So I, I think, you know, so there's already that being played out. Banks are already, they have already identified that, you know, the SME, SMEs and MSMEs, you know, do require, you know, some of these financial support measures. So they have their dedicated teams and units, you know, solely for the purpose of bringing these um, SMEs up to speed. So I think the next thing to do now is, you know, as the Financial institutions are playing their own part. You know, the M MSMEs and SMEs also, you know, have to internally increase their capacity. You know, by using this technology, um, by using technology to do that, right? You know, increase cap by leveraging on technology, increase their capacity, increase their operational excellence. You know, and coming up to speed and and being able to leverage on the um, support measures the banks are already providing and they can use technology to do that. So I, I think it's just a meeting of both parties, you know, that the financial institutions are doing their role. The MSMEs must also, you know, leverage on technology to be able to tap into what the um, financial institutions have, are providing. All right, there. It is a good way to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time there, speaking extensively uh, with issues regarding loans, restructuring loans uh, in the Nigerian banks, and of course, issues surrounding MSMEs. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Temitokwe. It's really brilliant having you join us on the show. We enjoy your contribution. Financial Advisory, a semi senior financial advisory at Deloitte. Enjoy the rest of your day, Timmy Tokwe.